nothing. Okay, sorry. She never had more than three or four months in here. Yeah. Hello, can you hear us in New York? Yes, we can. We certainly can. Excellent. New York State Racing Paramutual Wagering and Breeding Law Section 102 provides that the New York State Gaming Commission shall consist of seven members appointed by the governor by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. Five members having been confirmed by the New York State Senate affords the commission an ability to establish a quorum and undertake action. This present meeting of the commission is now called to order. Ms. Secretary, will you please call the roll? John Craddy. Here. Mark Eren. Here. John Paclemba. Here. Gary Sample. Here. Todd Snyder. Here. Ms. Secretary, will you please have the record reflect that a quorum of qualified members are present, thus enabling the transaction of business. Since the conduct of our last meeting, Governor Andrew M. Cuomo has designated Mark Guerin as Chair of the Gaming Commission. Chairman Guerin? Well, thank you, Mr. Williams and my fellow commissioners and staff colleagues. Uh, I welcome you to this meeting and appreciate the opportunity to coordinate this uh, from a remote distance for this first meeting, but I'm grateful to uh, for the opportunity to serve and to serve with these commissioners in particular, to the staff. We've had opportunities, Mr. Williams and Mr. Park and I, to have meetings in preparation of this meeting and my service. So I very much look forward to, to working with, with all of you. Um, while I am new to the commission uh, and to some of the issues uh, that we will be dealing with, uh, what is not new to me is uh, public service and the importance of it and the trust that we all have been placed uh, and granted in, in our assignment. So as I said to Governor Cuomo and to members of the Senate, I'm deeply honored by this uh, nomination and confirmation and I pledge to serve the citizens of New York with purpose and to work with my fellow commissioners on our work so that our uh, service is one marked with integrity and, and transparency. So it's clear we have a lot of work to do uh, this year and in this meeting uh, ahead, so I want to get right to it. So we begin with officially with the approval of the minutes from your meeting uh, on November 4th, 2013. Uh, the minutes um, of the commission meetings conducted on November 4th, 2013 have been provided to members in advance. And at this time, I'd like to ask members if there are any edits or corrections or amendments. I don't think so. No. Okay. Well, Madam Secretary, please uh, let the record uh, record that uh, reflect that our minutes were adopted. Uh, next on our agenda is the report of the Acting Executive Director, uh, Mr. Williams. Rob. Thank you. Today I'd like to discuss three issues of potential interest. First is to apprise you of the, of the Commission's preparation for commercial casino development. Second is to briefly discuss a few issues at Naira. And the third is to discuss the status of the Camelot Lottery Report that we had previously approved uh, the, the RFP at an earlier meeting. The Commission has recently taken a number of significant steps regarding the preparation for commercial casino development. First, the Office of Counsel has expanded its staff. <coughs> this past Monday, two new attorneys have joined us, one late of the national law firm of Jenner and Block, and the other from the staff of the Brooklyn Law School. A third will be joining the staff next week from the international law firm of Paul Weiss. Uh, Ed, are the, the new attorneys with you today? We have two of them with today. I'd like to introduce them all to the commissioners. We have Heather McCarn is with us and Hello, Jacqueline Heather. Vargo. Okay. And nice their focus initially will be on our efforts to uh, develop uh, our regulation of the commercial casinos in the state. Fantastic. As Ed mentioned, they're assigned to assist with the refinement of the RFA as well, the, the request for application initially, and then to develop the regulatory structure and licensing processes for the commercial casino and those who are engaged in the industry. As for the request for application, Commission staff has already created a skeletal document. As you all may be aware, the casino enabling legislation contains a significant number of mandatory elements. 
Additionally, there is a structural procedural language that is necessary for all such procurement documents. And we've included both of these materials in our present draft. Commission staff will then forward the draft materials to the gaming facility location board members so that they may undertake, with the assistance of their gaming advisory services consultant, the RFA's discretionary work. And this discretionary work includes the establishment of the licensing fee, the determination of minimum capital investment, the establishing for video lottery gaming facilities, any credit that might be applied from previous development, and also a determination as how local support will be illustrated. Moving on to Naira, as you're all aware, the New York Racing Association has received a spate of bad publicity recently with the news of a number of high profile crimes. The crimes include a horrific alleged rape after racing hours and the theft of memorabilia and office equipment from Aqueduct Racetrack. I'm reluctant to discuss the specifics of the former given the criminal case that is pending and the potential for civil litigation. We are, however, working with Naira management to ensure that there is an appropriate mechanism for notification of incidents and a compilation of events. The latter is important to understand trend development and ensure appropriate attention is given when circumstances warrant. As to the widespread publicity attendant to the utilization of video lottery gaming revenues at Aqueduct Racetrack, I'm pleased to report at the last meeting of the Naira Reorganization Board, Naira detailed various expenditures that are planned for each of the three racetracks. I think, however, that Naira can and should do better. And thus, I'm consulting with both the New York State Franchise Oversight Board and Naira management regarding increasing the transparency of video lottery gaming expenditures. To this end, we will be discussing with Naira, making plainly available on the internet, a posting that reflects the various capital investment from video lottery gaming revenues at each racetrack. Ideally, there would be a place where interested parties would be able to go to find the status of completed projects ongoing projects, and planned projects. As to Camelot, following a competitive process in December of 2013, the Commission awarded Camelot Global Services North America a contract to conduct market research in relation to alternative approaches for the future of the New York Lottery and the creation of a five-year business plan. This is an extremely broad-based review of lottery operation and is not intended to be a plan for, for lottery expansion. While the initial findings were timely delivered to Commission staff, Camelot continues to revise its final report, much of which will be ultimately posted to the Commission's website for public accessibility. The initial find or delivery included some findings and a variety of suggested approaches as to sales, marketing, and game development. The division has already sought to immediately implement several of these recommendations, such as a restructuring of the contract for advertising into separate contracts for media and creative services. This effort is already underway with the development of a draft new proposal for advertising services. The division is also reviewing recommendations for restructuring the methods of supporting some lottery retailers through a larger use of telephone-based processes. Such an implementation would afford our marketing representative staff to focus on greater individual sales execution with our agents that benefit from more personalized service. Additionally, one recommendation from Camelot was to continue the development of an instant ticket management pro pilot program, which has been found successful in Western and Central New York. To that end, Lottery has identified some 650 New York City-based retailers for the pilot program. An initial update on the effectiveness of this program on retail sales in New York City should be completed in another week. Finally, the Commission has moved to fill many of the vacancies within the Lottery Division, especially within the marketing branch. These new hires will reduce pressure on existing staff and will assist in the important function of meaningful succession planning. Mr. Gear. 
thank you very much, Rob, for that helpful report. Next on our agenda is the appointment of the gaming facility location board members. And I turn to Mr. Williams to outline the procedure. By New York Racing, Paramutual Wagering and Breeding Law, Section 109A, the Commission is required to appoint five individuals to serve as members of the Gaming Facility Location Board. As you are all aware, in February, the Commission announced the names of our first three appointments. Today, the Commission may take action to formally seat these nominees. You are aware of the statutory requirements and the prohibitions for the Board membership and the manner of identification, vetting, and conflicts checks that we undertook. Great. Well, thank you. So, with that, may I have a motion to accept the appointment of Paul Francis, Stuart Rabinowitz, and William C. Thompson, Jr. to the Gaming Facility Location Board. A motion? Mr. Chairman, Todd Snyder, I'll make the motion. Great. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. The, uh, the motion carries. Uh, we next turn to the, on our agenda to rulemaking, where there are several matters uh, before us. Uh, New York State's Racing Paramutual Wagering and Breeding Law 104.19 authorizes the Commission to promulgate rules and regulations that it deems necessary to carry out its responsibilities. To that regard, the Commission will, from time to time, promulgate rules and rule amendments pursuant to the State Administrative Procedure Act. And today, we have six rulemaking items for consideration. So I've asked Rob to, to outline the proposals. The first item for consideration today is the adoption of a proposed rule regarding claimed thoroughbred horses. The rule would require the previous trainer of a claimed horse to provide the new owner within 48 hours after the claiming race is made official with an accurate record of all cortico joint injections administered to the horse within the 30 days prior to the claiming race. This notice requirement would allow the new owner and trainer to make more fully informed decisions about veterinary care. The rule was recommended by the New York Task Force on Racehorse Health and Safety and was in effect as an emergency rule from December 12, 2012 until March 10, 2013, when the Commission permitted the rule to lapse while trainers adapted to a different emergency rule, which required them to submit a record of every cortico joint injection to the Commission within 48 hours of the injection. Trainers and their veterinarians now make such reports through the Commission's online reporting system. That online system now has the capability to allow the previous trainer, when requested by a claiming trainer, to grant access to the last 30 days of reported corticosteroid joint injections for the horse. Well, um, Dr. Palmer is, is with us here, and I guess my question is, my understanding as a former practicing veterinarian that you are, could you lend some insight to us in terms of the uh, administrative utilization of the system, and that is, how easy is the system to work and is it useful from your perspective? I'd be happy to comment on that. Thank you. Uh, the program is called ESAL. It's an equine steroid reporting system that's online that trainers have been using. I think we've got approximately 5,000 reported injections since the program started. And this program gives us a database that enables us to survey the use of medication in these horses and to track those medication treatments. It also provides the opportunity to uh, provide this information to new owners of horses when they claim them because a, a major problem we identified in the task force report was that uh, horses were being treated for a condition. They'd be in a claiming race claimed by a new trainer who would identify the same condition and do the same treatment over again because he had no idea how it had been treated beforehand. It just happened over and over again to the detriment of the horse. So this, this process is is still early uh, in its development, but it's working very well so far, and it's being continually updated as time goes on. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Mr. Burns, were there any uh, public comments received? 
yes the rule was proposed after the last meeting and during the public comment period we received one comment from naira the way we phrased the proposed rule was that the burden is on the previous trainer of the claimed horse to provide the information naira suggested that they provide the information to the commission and the commission in turn provide the information to the new trainer and owner we believe that a change in the language of the rule was not necessary but as dr palmer just explained the way it's actually being implemented electronically serves the same concern that naira was a visa of use that naira had raised with us which is since all of these injections are being reported within 48 hours on an ongoing basis they're already in our system and the only thing that technically needs to be done is the authorization from the previous trainer that the new trainer can actually look at and access those records so the way it's being implemented in practice is the way that naira suggested it would be for ease of all the horsemen and uh, we didn't think any change in the phrasing of the rule was necessary but we believe that uh, adoption of it will will address that concern great thank you Ed and dr. Palmer to the my fellow commissioners any uh, questions <coughs> on either the regulation or the process Ed was there any other comment uh, that we're not addressing or is this no other comment was received other than that thank you great well may I then have a motion to adopt the revised regulation on notice of cost of steroid injections and claim thoroughbred horses a motion so moved great thank you mr. Friday a second second great any discussion on the motion hearing none all in favor aye, aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Great. Our next is uh, rulemaking regarding shockwave regulation. Rob? The next item for commission consideration is the adoption of a proposed rule to restrict the use of extracorporeal shockwave therapy, radial pulse wave therapy, and similar physiological treatments on thoroughbred racehorses. Shockwave therapy and similar treatments involve the application of external pressure waves to an area of the horse to promote healing, but the ther therapy also makes the area numb for several days. This numbness poses a potential danger to thoroughbred race horses running at high speed and to their exercise riders and jockeys. Shockwave and other similar therapies are not known to create a similar danger to slower moving horses, such as those engaged in standard bred racing. This rule would closely regulate the use of shockwave treatments and other similar therapies so that thoroughbred horses could not be breezed or raced until the resulting numbness wears off great thank you Rob um, again dr. Palmer would you care to add anything to Rob's overview thank you mr. chairman I think the, uh, the overview was very accurate this regulation um, has been uh, in place as a house rule at Naira just for some time and I think that it has uh, established a regulatory pattern that's helped to uh, control the administration's therapy. And this uh, rule by the state will uh, provide the ability for the Gaming Commission to regulate it in, a, in an effective fashion. Great. Thank you, Dr. Again, Mr. Burns, any comments received? Public comments? No public comments since the rule was published as a proposed rulemaking. Uh, prior to our proposal, we had solicited comments from the thoroughbred tracks in the state. Uh, and Finger Lakes fully supported it, uh, as did Naira, and Naira had noted that they had a house rule that had some aspects of our proposal in it, and their interest was that uh, the rule that we eventually would propose and adopt be consistent and in harmony with their practices, uh, and it is. Great. Uh, commissioners, any questions on the regulation or the process? Okay, well, may I have a motion then to adopt the regulation on shockwave and similar therapies? I'd move that the regulation be adopted. Great, thank you. A second? Second. Terrific. Any discussion on the motion? Well, with that, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Opposed? The motion carries. The next item uh, for proposed rulemaking for standard grad out of competition testing. That's right. Thank you. The next item for consideration are proposed amendments to our standard bread out of competition testing rule designed to clarify the existing rule, define internal protocols of the commission, and to add improvements such as those contained in the once identical thoroughbred out of competition rule. In general, the out of competition rule protects race integrity by making it possible to detect the administration of potent doping agents that increase red blood cells mask pain, or increase a horse's ability to race beyond its natural limits. The rule, which includes a description and prohibition of such doping agents, also makes it possible to detect drug cocktails. A drug cocktail is the administration of various drugs in subclinical doses that are uh, effective because of the drug interactions. Such doping agents and drug cocktails may be readily administered in such a manner as to be undetectable in race day samples. Staff suggests the standard bread out of competition rule would be improved by incorporating many elements of the thoroughbred out of competition rule. The improvements would affirm the limited <coughs> nature of the collection program by expressly stating that a trainer or owner does not consent to a search of the premises simply by allowing an off-track horse to be sampled. Clarify that a trainer or owner must apprise the commission when he or she is not training the horse to race in New York in order to excuse a horse from sampling, and amend the, the category of prohibited substances that was criticized by the appellate court. Great. Thank you, Rob. Let me um, again turn to Dr. Palmer for any other additional comments to Rob's overview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, out of competition testing is a mission critical aspect of the Commission's ability to move forward and uh, detect the administration of drugs that cannot be identified in the normal race day testing program. So it, this is an extremely important rule in both the thoroughbred and the harness, and I, I think this is a, a, an appropriate uh, rule to accomplish that. Great. Ed, any comments you would add? Uh, the, the only comment I would add is is that the previous or, or currently existing standard bread rule was already upheld by the appellate division in almost its entirety, as Mr. Williams noted. Uh, the one issue that the appellate court had taken issue with, we would address in this rule to uh, to make sure that that uh, provision is is legal according to the courts uh, and. That being the issue of consent? No. The issue, the only issue was the way we had defined protein and peptide-based drug agents because there were two parts of the rule that appeared that it was permitted in some circumstances and completely banned in others. And the court said those two were irreconcilable. So the way we're going to clarify that or propose to clarify that is to say the only uh, such substances are only banned to the extent that they're producing certain effects in the horse and that way it will remove the uh, conflict that the court perceived in two, two portions of our rule. I see. Uh, and uh, it gives us the opportunity to add some safeguards to the uh, search issue, if you will, that even though the courts have upheld broader authority on behalf of the commission, we think are, are reasonable accommodations to the uh, horse owners and trainers that uh, for instance, would not make them bring a horse to New York unless we couldn't obtain reasonably a sample in the neighboring jurisdiction where they might be. Uh, so we thought those would be improvements to the existing rule, even though the broader authority has already been upheld to be legal. Any other questions from the commissioners on the regulation or the process? No? Well, hearing on none, may I have a motion then uh, to propose rulemaking for standard bread out of competition testing. Uh, so moved. Great. Thank you. A second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? The motion carries. Uh, our next proposed rulemaking is for new lottery game cash for life. The next item for consideration is a draft regulation to govern a new planned multi-state lottery game that select state lotteries from the Mega Millions and Powerball consortia will conduct. The name of the game will likely be Cash for Life. This new game would have drawings on Monday and Thursday. For each $2 wager, a player must select five numbers out of a field of 60 and one number out of a field of four. Players could also wager by the way of quick picks, which allow the computer system to generate random numbers as selections. Generally, the jackpot prize would be $1,000 a day for life, with the second prize being $1,000 a week for life. As the game name suggests, the two top prizes would be paid for life. Lower level prizes would be one-time prize payments ranging between $2 and $2,500. This cash for life game would replace the current New York lottery game, Sweet Million, which is presently also drawn on Monday and Thursday evenings. Sweet Million has had a limited success and has experienced slowing sales and declining consumer interest. Based on other for life, life-based prizes, we anticipate the net effect for aid to education to reach between eight and nine million dollars annually. Thank you, Rob. Let me ask uh, Gardner Gurney, who's the acting director for the division of the lottery, when would we expect uh, to be offering this game? Mr. Chairman, our plan is uh, to launch this game on May 16, uh, which is a Friday morning, and the first drawing would be May 19, which is a Monday. Great. Uh, to the commissioners, any questions on this uh, regulation or the process? Great. Well, may I have a motion then to propose rulemaking for the new Cash for Life lottery game? So Thank moved. You. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm sorry, Mr. Snyder. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, there were Certainly. two from the proposal that was sent to the commissioners beforehand. There are just two minor tweaks uh, based on some discussions with some of the other participating states. They're they're not substantive in nature, but I just wanted to alert the commissioners to that. That we'll we'll clean those up as we prepare it for submission to the Department of State for publication in the state register. One is that the name of the, the extra ball that's drawn. Uh, the states will prefer to call it a cash ball instead of a lucky ball, as you see in your draft. And then there's a certain tweak to uh, the nature of a lump sum payment for second prizes if there are a certain right. excessive so number of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll clean that up at a staff level and then uh, put that in the submission that's published uh, as a proposed tool making. Great. Which yes, Rob, it shared with me that these were uh, late, late adjustments. Um, but thank you, Ed. So, any other uh, questions on uh, regulation or uh, um, or the process from the commissioners? Great. So, do we have a a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll move the the adoption. Second. Great. Any discussion? All in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. And our next revised proposal rulemaking um, for controlled therapeutic harness and thoroughbred medications. Rob? Yes, before the commission are proposed revisions to the controlled therapeutic medications rules proposed on November 4th, 2013. Staff has reported that the rulemaking comment solicitation period result in several advisable recommendations. While most of the revisions are technical in nature, any revisions necessitates publication as revised rulemaking, which requires an additional 30-day public comment period. If we adopt these proposed revisions, the Commission would then be in a position to take final action on the collective set of proposed rules at the conclusion of the additional public comment period. It's my understanding that the, the suggested revisions may be divided between substantive and technical corrections. I guess in that regard, Dr. Palmer, um, would you please address the substantive changes and then, Ed, perhaps you could uh, please address the technical changes that Mr. Williams just mentioned. Dr. Palmer? Mr. Chair, 
Mr. Chairman, the principal substantive change is, is uh, really, uh, it's kind of technical, but this, the, the significant change is that the original recommendation by the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium and the Association of Racing Commissioners International was to recommend the use of 24 medications regulated by threshold and to assign all of the unapproved, they call them, let's call them the non-24 medications, into a category that we regulated with a zero tolerance um, testing program, meaning that no level of the medication whatsoever would be allowed in the system of the animal. Um, this is, uh, since, since this was first in, uh, recommended by those two groups, they have <coughs> changed course in their recommendations, and now they recommend that instead of having a zero tolerance regulation for all of the other 60-some medications in New York, that New York continue and other jurisdictions continue to regulate those substances by their existing rules uh, that are already in place. So there will be no changes recommended for those medications. So while that might seem like a technical thing, it really is a hugely important um, modification because there are a number of medications in that list of 64 that are perfectly appropriate for use in the horse and by banning them it would have created quite an inappropriate uh, response. Um, so it's a, that's a very positive change. It does of course require though that we resubmit the whole protocol for uh, the, the rule for another period of public comment. Um, another um, specific a significant change in, in particular with regard to New York was it, this section of rules includes a regulation to prohibit the administration of clenbuterol, which is a bronchodilator, to be given to thoroughbred race horses within 14 days of a race, and that rule was part of the national recommendation um, and has been very uh, well supported by the thoroughbred horsemen in New York. The uh, harness horsemen expressed during the public hearings a, a significant concern about uh, using the same time-restricted rule of 14 days in harness because they race more frequently and in, for some portion of the year they actually race every week. So that if we made a 14 day rule for clenbuterol for harness, we would in fact ban the drug from use in, in standard breads. Now um, what the commission has done is we've, we've met and talked about this quite a bit. We have language in this proposed new rule that uh, although the language is slightly different from thoroughbred to harness, it is this rule will have exactly the same effect in both breeds. It just simply takes into account the racing protocols for the breeds being different. For example, in the harness end of things, uh, a horse that a standard bred who has not qualified to race, meaning that they have not raced within 30 days, uh, will have to abide by the 14-day rule, and the harness horsemen have agreed to that. Uh, however, if a horse is already qualified and is in active racing, then the uh, horse would then be regulated at 96 hours, giving them the opportunity to administer clenbuterol for two days after the race had still raced the horse the following week. Um, and it, there is a lot of scientific research being done on, on this drug right now. And until such a time as further evidence becomes available in which we can make a more definitive rule, we felt like this was an appropriate way to regulate these two uh, breeds by accomplishing the same thing but using slightly different language. So there's no substantive difference between the rules in thor thoroughbred and harness, even though the language is very different. So those are the two uh, major substantive changes in the rule. Ed, do you want to speak to this? Oh, please, go uh, ahead, no, I will, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Crotty had a question first, I believe. Yes, go ahead, John. I, I, I spoke to those guys, um, Toraldo and company, and they made a big push about needing, uh, you know, what you know, to run on a regular basis. And I, I, you know, I accepted what they were telling me at face value, but it's still intuitively doesn't make sense to me. You're a veterinarian. Do they need it? Because well, it seemed like an enhancement. They had standard bread racing before they had drugs. <coughs> now they have drugs. Now they say you need drugs to have standard bread racing. The bridge doesn't work, but they were pretty emphatic that it does. I think, uh, Mr. Crody, the, most, mo the more appropriate question is um, not that do they need it. The question is, does it work? And uh, Given the, the uh, protocol that they recommend that where they say they need it, are they actually using a medication that is effective in that protocol that they're describing? That's the more appropriate question, and, the, and that question needs to be answered with some research that's pending right now. But um, we'll be able to answer that question a little more appropriately as soon as that research is completed. So it's been around for some period of time. You're a veterinarian longer than 20 years plus, right? They've been running on this right. stuff. They're researching it now. We're going to get a different answer now, 20 plus years later, or? The question, a research project is focused on a particular question. The particular question is not does clenbuterol have an effect. I mean, it's a very useful bronchodilator. There's no question about sure. that. 
Uh, we also, though, over time come to appreciate that it has an anabolic repartitioning effect that is the point of these regulations, that the rule that we're writing is actually designed to prevent the use of this drug to accomplish a repartitioning effect. And this rule will do that, absolutely will do that. The question of whether or not it's appropriate to give the drug for treatment of airway disease in the manner in which they have described that they want to do it is a totally separate question, which again is, is one that hasn't been investigated and one is being looked at right now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm actually a little confused. So. We don't we don't uh, want to authorize the use of clomiterol for its anabolic effect. Am I That's getting correct. that right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not sure that it's efficacious. No, we're not sure. If it, see, for but, but I'm sorry. Wait, just for one second. I want to understand the the, the the question as you laid it out. But we're not sure yet because we haven't had the research yet to see to determine whether it's efficacious for uh, its use after racing to be a bronchodilator? This drug is, is labeled for use in the horse as a bronchodilator, and, and it was uh, created to treat horses with heaves or an, a pulmonary emphysema type condition. And in so doing, the manufacturer recommends giving the drug for 14 days in a row and then stopping because the receptors in the cells get saturated effectively that the medical treatment for a respiratory disease is to give it 14 days and stop. Um, that is not the protocol that the harness uh, industry is, recommend, is suggesting in which they're using it. They're using it with a slightly different application. And the question is, is it, is it useful in that application? We just don't know the answer to that right now. So, so we're creating this rule so that it can be used out of protocol? Is that what we're saying? We're creating a rule that allows, for the time being, the harness industry to use this medication. It does have mucociliary clearance effects. Those that help clear out mucus to some degree. The question is, by giving it two days, is that enough to really accomplish that? We just don't know the answer to that right now. So we are com in the in the air, in the t for the time that we are making this rulemaking going forward. We are the goal is not to determine whether or not it's significant to, to clear mucus. What we're trying to do is prevent the, its use as an anabolic agent, and this drug will do that. Now, whether the, whether the rule needs to be modified further down, the question is if it if it if it uh, you know at a very small dose given for a couple of days does it create an anabolic effect? We don't have the answer to that yet. So it's inappropriate, perhaps, to um, regulate it exactly the same way in both breeds, using the same language, given the different ways that these medications are used. Do you know well, John had another question. What did they do before the drug existed? Did the yeah. horse not run, or...? Well, uh, there, are other, there are alternatives to treatment, and th th uh, there are veterinarians who believe that, that clenbuterol is very useful for this, and there are other veterinarians who think there are other drugs that are more useful for it. So there are alternatives to treat this medical condition <coughs> besides clenbuterol. So Dr. Palmer, could I could I ask a question? Sure. The, the first is, is simply is uh, th this drug has been in use in harness racing for how long? Yeah. Well, since the 90s, it's been around for quite a while. Since the 1990s, and it's it's currently under its present use. It's allowed to be used today. Yes. So the concept here on, on the rule or the proposed rule is simply to ensure that it can't be used for anabolic purposes, but still continue its its present ability to be used for what it's been used for since the 1990s, right? That's correct. Okay, J just just clarifying, that's all. Thank you. So, when who's conducting the study and when do we anticipate it being completed by? The University of Pennsylvania is conducting the study and I don't know the exact timetable. I would say within a year. Okay. So, should we think about the return of that study in the context of the new rule? Well, I would recommend that, that under the circumstances that the best thing for the industry at the will be to adopt the rule as proposed and that we can certainly revisit it as new scientific, as, as in any rule, revisit it with, as new scientific information becomes available. Everyone has a lot of things going on and reports come and go. Um, you can include some sort of time frame within the rule to have it revisited by determination now, right? I mean, if we're waiting for this report, which hopefully will be conclusive one way or the other, it might be interesting to look at this rule when that report comes out in, say, a year's time, to sort of figure out whether or not this is the right protocol or use. Wouldn't you say if the, if the report's going to determine its effectiveness, why wouldn't you want to be forced to look at it in a year? So I'm not sure exactly what you're recommending. When we approve a rule, it's a rule for forever until 
you go back in and actively do something, there's a way to approve rules so that they force you to relook at them when certain elements come back up. For instance, a conclusive report from Pennsylvania that talks about the effectiveness of it. Well, I, I think, Mr. Crowdy, I think part there's there's sort of two aspects of it, and you're, you know, maybe addressing one of them. The the proposal here is meant to address the misuse of the drug for anabolic effects, mm -hmm. which would be true independent of, as I understand it, the research being done at the University of Pennsylvania. Would that the timing research, be the same? The timing wouldn't be the same, Well, right? that. Because the that protocol was to get rid of it for 14 days in advance. It was determined that that was not effective, anabolic or not, right? But if you stop 14 days away, you, you basically uh, eliminated the ability to achieve an anabolic effect of the drug. Yeah. So, so I think this whole proposal, that, that aspect of it, is meant to address the misuse of the drug for the anabolic effect. But I think you're raising another interesting question, which is, should it be regulated for other effects? And that, as I understand, is what Dr. Palmer is saying research is being done at that you might want to look at and revisit down the line. But that that research won't bring anything to bear, as I understand it, on the regulation of the improper anabolic effect that we're trying to look at. I mean, is that the case? That's true. Did I, did I no, kind no, of state I that accurately? I, th I think the focus here is, is on the, the, the misuse of the drug for anabolic use. And this rule will prevent that. And so I, I believe that your point is valid, and I, and, and I can assure you that we will be looking at this drug in an ongoing fashion. This is not something that's going to go away. It's something mm -hmm. that we'll be looking at quite closely. Um, but the uh, important thing is that this rule will accomplish the goal. The rational you know, reason for making this rule is to prevent the use of it as an anabolic agent. It will do that. So I believe that even though the language is slightly different, given the different um, training and racing schedules of the breeds, it will accomplish the same thing in both breeds, which is, the, the, I think, the most important or the core concept here that we need to focus on. Okay. So hearing that, and given Commissioner Crotty's but interest, Rob, what? would it make sense for us to keep this current when this research is complete? And we could look to Rob to make sure that Commissioner Crotty's uh, interest is, is taken into account. There's no doubt that we can track the, the, uh, the study. The study will actually be uh, very, very widely disseminated when it's finally released from the University of Pennsylvania, and that's something that uh, Dr. Palmer's unit can, can also monitor as well. Does that make sense, John? I, I think so, right? I mean, if you're going by the best scientific evidence, if something proves differently, you'd want to have the ability to go back in. I mean, I guess you have that ability no matter what, Correct. whatever you want, but... but it would be not bad if we're sort of pending some sort of formation of thought on this based on what the research says to sort of force us to take another look at it. Commissioner, I think you're exactly you right. I can assure you that we'll do that. Yeah, so it would be interesting to note. It, it, just as a point of trivia, how did they propose a series of substances that actually turned out that they needed to... Right, it said originally that the group had proposed a series of substances that actually turn out to be useful. Well, how does that mismatch occur? Do you know? Or Well, it, the, the 24 medications were chosen because it's a very expensive process to regulate medication in the horse. You have to have uh, uh, studies done to document the withdrawal times, you know, the safe withdrawal times for any medication that you have. Mm -hmm. And if you have hundreds of medications that are out there, and there are thousands, then it's simply impossible for any racing jurisdiction to fund all the studies necessary to document every single drug. So it's very important to, uh, and the ARCI and the RMTC gathered a group of veterinarians from around the country and said, what are your most essential medications that you need to practice appropriate veterinary medicine on the racetrack close to race day? You know, what do you need? What do you exactly need? And, that, and this was the list. That list has actually uh, had a couple of other drugs recommended by the American Association of Equine Practitioners. The RMTC made it very clear that this is a living document that as new drugs are come along, that they could be added to this list if they were documented to be effective and safe and helpful. So there, that, that process was a, took about a year to get that together. Very controversial. And these were the drugs that were settled on as the, the must-have medications. And it's not that, that all the other medications can't be used. You just, just shouldn't use them in close proximity to the race. 
Any other okay. questions or concerns from the commission? Okay, well, do we have uh, a motion on the proposal? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may clarify too, what, what's before the commission for consideration is revised proposals that will then be published in the state register right. and then after all comment is collected, it'll be before the commission again for everything to be tied up in one proposed <coughs> So yeah, let me, that's, thank you, Ed. So this is a motion to propose a revised rulemaking for controlled therapeutic harness and thoroughbred medications, to be clear. So I would entertain a motion for that proposal of the revised we'll rulemaking. A motion. Yeah, I'd like to. Can, can I ask one question, though? Can, can we solicit specifically and ask for a couple trainers <laughs> or people out there to sort of comment on it in the affirmative that the, the the publishing of the rules wherever they get published and the lack of comments is always problematic I bring it up each time it's never clear to me who we solicited comment from I, I don't care who the list is you know pick a couple guys upstate a couple guys downstate the women men whatever just asking professionals for their opinion and if you mail it or ask them specifically if they have none It'd be under, and we don't have to make the list public, but to say these are the people we asked for comment and they said nothing. It would be interesting to solicit that feedback in a very direct way, right? No, Mr. Cry, we'll definitely do that. And, and there's no doubt with this bundle of proposed rules, we've already received a number of comments and had a public hearing where people had very strongly expressed views on the topic. So we will make sure that every, not only everyone on our contact list will get the revised proposal, but specifically everyone who has submitted a comment on the previous proposal, make sure we alert them to the current proposal and, and gather all of that. And that's good. I think there's a universe of people, though, that probably are involved with this industry on a day-to-day -day basis that, that don't want to write back or don't solicit or don't feel they have a voice, not wholly dissimilar to the number of people who don't vote in elections, even though they're fully able to. It would be good to actively solicit some of their you know, not a ton, not overly burdensome on the staff, but, you know, a couple Finger Lakes people, a couple Trotter guys, pick a couple tracks, and a couple flat guys in the Naira world. Not necessarily the head of the agency, but, you know, numbers seven, eight, and nine on the training board for the Aqueduct Winter Mead, or I, you pick the formula to get their comments and say, hey, we asked them specifically and they came back with X. Maybe nothing, but it'd be good to know we were a little bit proactive on it and if this is a big rule like that it'd be interesting to hear what their feedback was I, in all theories uh, or all walks of government my experience has been there are professional people on both sides of the issue pick the issue and they're always willing to lend their voice to whatever it is it's not that their point's not valid I'm just not sure if they're tapping into a real vein or if it's a 20-year career for the pro and con on either side right mm -hmm. I saw some of the feedback from somebody earlier <laughs> LASIK stuff from before, and those names all were very similar to the ones I think we'd see again in something like this, with it probably <coughs> the exact same comments, mm -hmm. new dates. <laughs> this has come up before, and I don't want to take up too much time on it, but normally what do we do in terms of posting? The, the acting, well, a yeah. couple of things. So formally, it gets published in a state register, so yeah. anyone monitoring that you know, has the opportunity to look <laughs> at that. And <laughs> the three guys from where? But we also, we also, <laughs> not even. <laughs> the acting secretary of the commission maintains a list of interested parties who okay. reached out to the commission and said they want to be apprised of developments in whether it's harness, thoroughbred, both, uh, and other areas as well. And whether even in the pre-proposal stage, we often solicit comments from mm -hmm. that group as well, but certainly when we reach the proposal or revised proposal stage, everything is again sent out to that entire mailing list by electronic mail and affords them the opportunity to at least have it. And out of that list, and we'd be making a more intimate reach out. Well, I, mean, this well, I, think, I, I think what yeah, Commissioner yeah. Cry is suggesting is that maybe there are people out in the regulated yeah. community who haven't even taken the time to get on For that sure. mailing list yeah. and that 
the commissioner suggests that perhaps we ought to make an effort or to reach out to some of them. Pay attention to the state register. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one, one other thing I would make note of um, is that the uh, proposed rules are also put onto the Gaming Commission's website. Very okay, close. so with that as no, we can, we we'll we'll certainly endeavor to to I make mean, that. How could it hurt? You know, you're not looking to create multiple hours worth of work. If you had a straight list of questions, tacking it on their door, saying you got any feedback on this would be useful. I, again, I'm not looking to create more work than necessary, but it'd be good to get some other feedback. Okay. You had some big names on the list before. Obviously, they represent the industry, but. We'll do so. Good. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you all. So with that as um, as a good dialogue, I, let me then ask for a motion to propose a I'm revised rulemaking. Sample. Sample. Mr. Sample. sample. Great. Yes. Second? Sure. Second. Great. All in favor. Any discussion? I think we've had some good. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Let's now turn to the proposed rulemaking regarding altering harness and thoroughbred horses. Ouch. The last rulemaking for consideration today is a proposal <laughs> wherein the gilding of a horse <laughs> would be required to be reported to both the racing secretary and the official <laughs> horse <laughs> identifier <laughs> if the horse is entered into race at any race meeting. Staff has heard concerns raised by the wagering public about the absence of any rule or procedure which required the timely reporting of first-time geldings in races. As it is generally accepted wisdom that the first-time geldings are likely to run better than they ran before they were gelded, timely information on first-time geldings would be helpful to handicappers. We note that California, Oklahoma, and Texas all have similar rules. Um, Mr. Burns, um, anything to add to the overview? No, sir. Thanks, Burns. Okay. I didn't know it. Any, any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> you have a good question. So, may, may I have a motion then to propose rulemaking regarding the yes. uh, rep reporting the gelding of harness and thoroughbred horses? Snyder. So moved, Mr. So Snyder. Moved, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank second. you, Mr. Steiner. Second. Great. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. None for the record. Opposed? Yes. The motion carries. We now next turn to our next uh, agenda item uh, regarding adjudications. The Commission has three hearing officer reports for consideration today. And I've asked uh, Mr. Williams to outline the cases. First is in the matter of Graham Lewis. Rob. The first case regards Graham Lewis, whose application for occupational harness owner, harness trainer, and harness driver license was denied upon a finding that Mr. Lewis's experience, character, and general fitness are such that his participation in racing or related activities in the state of New York is inconsistent with the public interest, convenience, or necessity or with the best interest of racing generally. Mr. Lewis appealed the denial and a hearing was conducted on July 30th, 2013. The hearing officer recommended that the license denial be upheld. All members have received a copy of the hearing officer's report and have an opportunity to, have had an opportunity to review a record of the hearing. Would anyone like to uh, discuss either the report or the recommendation? Hearing none, may I have a motion to adopt the hearing officer's report and confirm its findings and the recommendations as submitted? So moved. Great, thank you. A second? Second. Great, any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. The next adjudication is in the matter of Greg Luther. The second case regards an appeal by harness driver Gregory Luther. The presiding judge of Batavia Downs found Mr. Luther used unauthorized equipment and subsequently threatened the judge. After being fined $1,000 for these violations, Mr. Luther appealed and a hearing was conducted on October 29, 2013. The hearing officer found Mr. Luther uh, guilty of various rules infractions 
but recommended a fine reduction to $500. Again, all members have received a copy of the hearing officer's report and have had an opportunity to review the record of the hearing. Would anyone like to discuss the report or the recommendations? I have a question. How are yes. fine amounts determined? There is a uh, precedent that is available for research both at the track level and by the hearing officer. Uh, there are certain enumerated things in statute that are in our regulations that have specific penalties imposed, but a lot of it is discretionary, and it's something that... How wide is this discretion? It depends on the type of infraction, but it can be wide, and it a lot of times depends on the disciplinary history of the person in question uh, and the nature of the conduct. In this case, what is the maximum fine that could have been imposed? I don't believe there's a regulatory maximum or statutory maximum is 25000 That's awfully broad. Could we consider adopting some regulations with a, a schedule with narrower limits so we, we don't give discretion. I think that the uh, the uh, testimony in this case no. was that the uh, initial uh, officer who was investigating this matter based the fine on the financial ability of the person to pay, and that's a very difficult determination for them to make uh, without having uh, documentation. I, I think it, it would be helpful if there was a schedule of fines like you have in other situations and other laws that would give them direction with narrower limits on how much. It seems to me that zero to twenty-five thousand dollars is is way too way too much discretion. I agree. We will Ron undertake Manning. to study that issue and give you a report back to you with a sense of the historical range of things and certain categories of violations that come up often to give you a better sense of <laughs> how that discretion has been exercised historically but, but, as well. But short of that, Ed, I mean, it, this is a, it's a fair reading of the record. Don't you think that the, the presiding judge um, simply, uh, simply replaced his, his discretionary judgment for the officer's uh, discretionary judgment. That's all that's happening here, right? There's, yeah. no, there's no other basis for the determination of the 500. Correct. And you have the discretion to substitute your discretion for the hearing officer's recommendation, too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Good discussion. Um, well, with that, uh, may I have a motion to adopt the hearing officer's report and confirm its findings? and recommendations as submitted. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll move uh, accepting the recommendations. Second. A second. Great. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Uh, our final is in the matter of Janet Smith. Rob. The third case regards an appeal by TOTE employee Janet Smith. Ms. Smith was denied license upon a finding that her experience, character, and general fitness are such that her participation in racing or related activities in the state of New York is inconsistent with the public interest, convenience, or necessity, or with the best interest of racing generally. Following Mrs. Smith's appeal, a hearing was conducted on January 22nd 2014. The hearing officer recommended that the license denial be reversed and that the commission grant Ms. Smith a license as a tote employee. All members have received a copy of the hearing officer's report and have had an opportunity to review the record of the hearing. Thank you, Rob. Would anyone uh, like to discuss either the report or recommendation? Uh, just one minor point. On, on the final page of the report, there's listed of five findings of fact. And uh, I was just speaking for myself. I wouldn't want my uh, uh, vote in favor of accepting this report 
to accept all five findings of fact, especially number five, which I think is, is way too broad. I, I, I tend to agree with Commissioner Paklemba that, that finding number five isn't necessary to the finding overall in the report, and I think the uh, report would get to the same conclusion without it. Exactly. Any other discussion? So, Rob, uh, being my first meeting here, do we uh, would this be a, a motion as amended? No, I, th I think you could have a motion, and then simply to have the record reflect that Commissioners Paklumba and Snyder do not agree with the finding five, but otherwise concur with the decision. I don't think it's, it's limited to the two. Yeah. Yeah. Those, they, those two verbalized their, yeah. issue, their yeah. concerns, but I don't think the concern is limited to, two, to the two of them. Yeah, may I, I have a similar concern. Yeah. May I suggest the chairman then, then present for consideration then or entertain a motion to adopt the uh, hearing officer report with the exception of item five and ask that uh, uh, entertain a motion to adopt it as amended, which is within the discretion of the, the commission to consider. All right. Well, may, may I have a motion to adopt the hearing uh, officer? Todd, did you may want I, to may I just, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure, um, d does, does the, uh, the finding have to conclude that um, the applicant, uh, Ms. Smith, um, d does not lack the character and fitness? And because if we take out number five, I, I don't know if we actually need a finding by the presiding judge that Ms. Smith has the appropriate character and fitness, and I don't know if we have that. So I, I just want to be careful not to take this apart and end up not getting where we want to go. Well, I think I think the other, the other findings as stated in the report suggest that the basis on which the licensing unit had initially denied the licensing application is not was found to be not supported by the Good. record of the proceeding. Got it. Yep. So I think the, the recommendation of the it's hearing officer necessary. report could stand with recommendations one through four, and then you as, co as the commission, as the final arbiter of this, this decision making, can modify the hearing officer report to exclude item number five. Okay, very good. Thank you. So the motion that I would entertain is to adopt the hearing officer's report, uh, ex Except. accepting um, finding number five, and confirm its findings and recommendations as submitted. I would so move. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion that's been made and seconded? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. We now turn to uh, uh, nearing our last uh, items on our agenda, new business. I'd entertain any new business uh, brought before the commission. There was one item I had that I thought would be relevant. Um, recently down in Gulfstream, they have a bet, uh, the Rainbow Pick Six, Rang Rainbow Six, and if there's a single winner, the, the pool's very big. One guy had a ticket. The ticket uh, had the winner. They disqualified the horse. His ticket was ruled invalid, and they had to roll up. The steward's decision was met with... Um, uh, just made <laughs> well by one person for sure you know and uh, more importantly by the racing press who rightly questioned how these stewards were making the decision was it in a vacuum what what was the what was the concept how did they come to their conclusion there wasn't a lot of of uh, visibility into the decision making right and so in, in that regard in New York State I think it'd be interesting if we start taking a look at sort of how our stewards operate and the things that they operate uh, when, when, when they make certain decisions, some sunshine onto the process on how they make those decisions. Uh, specifically, um, who voted for what, when they vote, was it two to one, three to one, five, you know, whatever the, uh, the vote numbers were. Um, who was communicating with the stewards at that point? There's been some allegations of outside influence on the stewards down in uh, Gulfstream. And again, not, not by me, I don't know if any of it's true. 
It's just what's been written uh, out there where they said, well, it, it was better for the track to have a bigger carryover so as to not award the winner. It was a, it was a disqualification that was, you know, apparently somewhat close. And a lot of these matters are somewhat close. You know, one horse hits another. Sometimes it's crystal clear. A lot of times it's a judgment call. How you come to that judgment, uh, I think, is relevant. And, uh, you know, understanding at the commission level how those decisions were made and making those decisions and perhaps the video, I don't know if that's too laborious or some form of record of those decisions available to the public on a timely basis so that they understand uh, what decisions were made by whom and why they were made. Uh, it's, I throw it out there because it, it didn't seem like the suggestions were unreasonable. I don't know if you guys have thought about this, Rob, if you thought about it or, or Ed. No, I think the Commissioner Cry, those are very good suggestions, and it may make sense, Rob, for you to look into these suggestions or if you have reflections now, but to come back to the commission and provide us with a with an update? Yeah, no, no problem at all. But uh, as Commissioner Crotty said, this has gotten quite a bit of publicity in a lot of the racing press recently. So it is certainly uh, an opportune time to examine steward practice and see what we can reform in the concepts of trying to, to bring a little transparency to the decision making. Yeah, and right. you know, part of the push, part of the push on this was um, uh, some, you know, the writers obviously are usually uh, big players in the track. They also had mentioned in one of the stories that there's a, a fan association which sounds like some sort of collective of bigger gamblers who I think now are protesting Gulfstream. So I, I think it has an economic impact, could have an economic impact as well. Um, it's worth considering. We actually have a racing fan advisory council that advises the commission on, on various things that are of importance to, to racing patrons and that's an issue that we might be able to bring up with them as well for some research mm. and for some examination. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Crotty. Uh, any other new business uh, before the commission? Well, let me um, then, if I could, just take a moment, um, as this is my first meeting serving as chair, I, I wanted to take before the commission an issue that I have a particular interest in uh, and concern about. And I think it's quite relevant to the work of our commission. This starts. Um, with my preparation uh, for my confirmation and reviewing uh, the statute for casino gaming and noted with interest the significant role and the importance for the commission that we will have uh, regarding applicants, the plans they would have for problem gambling. I think this is an issue uh, that it will be relevant for us when we renew and issue licenses. So given this responsibility, it seems to me uh, that it would make sense for the Commission to be proactive uh, in this arena, uh, perhaps conducting a, a learning forum where we could have colleagues from state governments, New York Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, and, and other experts from within New York and beyond uh, who are aware of the um, gambling industry uh, efforts to discuss best practices uh, that exist uh, and approaches to prevention and treatment. Uh, during the course of this preparation, I was also made aware that March is National Problem Gambling Awareness Month. So appropriate for this focus, appropriate for my first meeting here in my interest here to serve as the chair. So I think it's timely for us to discuss this important issue. I've also been made aware, made aware through my study, the good news is that this gaming commission, and Lee Park in particular, has been very instrumental, and the commission has done very notable work in the development of a responsible play partnership. So I've asked Lee to present uh, an overview of the partnership, how it was developed, uh, what it has done, and what we intend to do in the near and distant future for this <laughs> issue area that's, that's a personal interest of mine during my tenure as chair, and I think one that all the commission certainly shares. Lee? Certainly. Um, well, first off, I'd like to recognize the excellent work done by Carolyn Hateman of the Gaming Commission staff, who's really 
uh, dived into this issue and, and, and done the lion's share of the work. So um, our collective thanks to her for all of her great work on this. Uh, one of the first significant acts taken by the agency was to form a standing collaboration between the New York Council on Problem Gambling, the uh, Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, also known as OASIS, and the commission, um, we formed what is known as the Responsible Play Partnership. And what that is is a uh, long-standing group that examines all the issues surrounding problem gambling, insur including ensuring that gaming venues comply with all the applicable rules and regulations, uh, that they undertake the proper outreach measures. Um, additionally, we're reevaluating self-exclusion policies across the state to ensure consistency and considering the best ways to advance New York's long-term commitment to prevent and treat compulsive gambling. Uh, the partnership is working to provide real-world tools and resources needed to adequately address the issue, and promoting problem gambling prevention and ensure treatment services are available to those New Yorkers who struggle with compulsive gambling. Um, we have established a working group of members from the commission uh, OASIS and the Council on Problem Gambling that meets quarterly to review existing gaming policies and programs and recommend changes as needed. Uh, some of the actions that I've taken so far has been an increased focus on <coughs> underage gambling. Um, we have developed a strategic administrative approach to ensuring compliance with the existing age restriction laws for gambling products, including uh, purchase of lottery tickets, presence in OTB facilities, uh, paramutual wagering and gaming at VLT facilities. Um, last year we launched a uh, component known as the Under 18 WeCheck ID. It's the law educational initiative which includes two components. That's comprehensive training for the employees at lottery retailers, tracks, VLT facilities, and charitable gaming locales on how to identify underage individuals and consequences for permitting underage play. Additionally, the, the second component is a campaign to educate the gambling public of the age restriction laws in New York State. Uh, we're pleased to report that the WeCheck ID program has garnered a 97% compliance rate across its 18,000 lottery retailers statewide. And uh, similarly, we've had strong compliance rates being uh, reported across the other gaming components as well. Uh, as um, our commissioners in New York City know, back in November at our last meeting, the commission proposed a series of penalties to accommodate an enforcement of these of, of underage sale and gaming. Uh, the penalty structure is currently pending um, uh, public comment, and uh, it, it expects to be you know once the public comment period is over, will be formally put forth the commission for formal adoption. Um, additionally, the Commission and the Responsibility Partnership has uh, looked into the issue of self-exclusion, which uh, allows people who self-identify as problem gamblers to request that they be prohibited from entering facilities or prohibited from particip participating in gaming, uh, in gaming activities which are um, uh, throughout the state. Um, the existing policies have been found to be relatively inconsistent amongst various venues. Uh, last summer, um, we brought all the uh, track operators and VLT operators together and got a conceptual agreement to explore creating a statewide self-exclusion program. There's some technical and administrative issues on the back end that need to be resolved in advance of the launch of such a program. But everybody's on board with doing it, which is good news. Um, so that's a, big, that's, that's a big component of what we're working, working on this year. Uh, there's a number of issues we're doing this month, as you noted, Chairman, that it is National Problem Gaming Awareness Month. Uh, we've placed the Commission's It's Just a Game Play Responsibly message um, featuring the OASIS helpline on all of our public promotion screens at 18,000 licensed lottery retailers statewide. We've added the It's Just a Game Play Responsibly and the, the Helpline Addictions Hotline number on all of our draw game tickets. And we've linked to the Problem Gambling PSA produced by the National Council on Problem Gambling from the Gaming Commission, Lottery, and other RPP member websites. Um, and that's basically where we are right now. And how about the idea of a convocation, maybe some kind of forum or 
session. We can certainly do that. Um, it's something that we can uh, uh, involve Oasis and the New York Council on Problem Gambling. I'm sure they'd be uh, thrilled to uh, to assist with that, and uh, we'd be happy to take it on. Great. Um, great. Is this something that my fellow commissioners feel would be a good direction for the commission? Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we've talked around it in the past, but haven't really paid the attention to it that we need to and want to and should. Who is our main contact at Oasis? Lee? At Oasis uh, would yeah. probably be uh, the commissioner, Arlene Gonzalez-Sanchez, um, as well as uh, her, the, deputy. her deputy, who is uh, Sean Byrne. Mm. Great. Well, I, I appreciate that and thank Lee for the the efforts to date, I think this could be a very good uh, focus, and I look forward to working with you, Lee, and the other commissioners on this. Um, next is old business on the uh, on the agenda. Is there any old business that needs to be revisited? Okay, our virtually final task here is scheduling of the next meeting. Um, it's my understanding that the Commission has contemplated the establishment of a uniform date uh, for our meetings, that is the third Wednesday of each month. Um, do we have progress towards a firm date establishment? Yes. As good as any other. Who's the meeting? People? Oh, yeah. As good as any other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's as good as it gets. Is that what we're saying down in New York? Yeah, yeah someone has a question. When would be the date of the next? I guess we're in April then, right? Does anybody know what that Probably. date is? Because we might know. People may have, know now if they've got an issue or not. So we're looking at the third week of April. Yeah. If What's you're looking it? at, for instance, 16. the third Wednesday. 16. The third, yeah, to be April 16th. Kristen saying it's the 16th. That would appear to be the case. Is it Good Friday, that Friday? Good Friday is the 18th, yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm around, but... Yeah, I can... Okay. Yeah, as long as we're here or all, we're fine. Yeah, okay. As long as we're... Like something off, try is to make it, one. Hold on a second. Is it Passover? Okay. You should oh, check okay. that. I can't tell. No. That's a big issue. Mm -hmm. What were you saying, Chris? Well, we, well, why don't we... Um, why don't we review all calendars and we will promptly right. get back to the commissioners. Right. Yeah. But that's yeah. out of the club. <laughs> we are we are searching for uh, a consistent date and to get ahead of the calendar for the balance uh, of this year. Um, so we will get back to two folks. That concludes today's uh, published agenda. Do any commissioners have any additional items they'd like to present for consideration? Uh, Mr. Chairman, at uh, one point, if you're going to do that, that would be immensely helpful to lay on the calendar for the next period of time that date, whatever it may be. It doesn't really matter when it is for the next one, but just knowing what the June, July, and next September dates would be very useful. There's been right. some very, yeah. maybe there needs to be more going forward, but pegging a date now for the rest of the year would be great. All right, I think for many of us, the the more locked in that can be. Um, so that's what we will endeavor to do for this calendar year. Lovely. Thank you. Great. Well, hearing no other um, business or items, this meeting and my very first meeting of the New York State Gaming Commission is adjourned. I thank my fellow commissioners and our able staff here. They've traveled out to uh, wintry conditions here in Geneva, New York. Uh, for this opportunity, but I, I thank you for all of your public service on this commission and our, our staff colleagues that are here in this meeting uh, remains adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. Well done. Good. Great